Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kaleido LA. I'm Karen Rapp, and I'm hosting the Visiting Artist Lecture Series known as Kaleido LA. I'm currently in the LeBand Art Gallery on the Loyola Marymount University campus in Los Angeles. I want to acknowledge this land as the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. I also want to acknowledge my colleagues in the Department of Art and Art History for affording me this very special opportunity to curate a series of web-based conversations around themes of social, economic, and racial justice in the arts. I am very grateful to the team behind the scenes, Arturo Mejia, Emma Pollan, Molly Corey, Keith Jones, and Jose Camacho. And I especially thank the artists who have spoken about their upbringing, values, inspirations, and challenges in this series. I hope that by sharing their stories with us, and in particular with our students, these artists will inspire our work toward creating and maintaining diversity, equity, and inclusion in the arts at LMU. A quick note about housekeeping. There is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen where you can pose questions and make comments throughout the talk. Once the lecture portion is finished, your question will be read aloud by the LeBan's gallery manager, Molly Corey. Your questions and comments will also be shared with the artist after the session is over. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be archived on YouTube with a link available on the Kaleido LA website. It is my great privilege to welcome and introduce Audrey Chan. Audrey is a Chinese American artist who grew up in the Midwestern United States. She earned her BA with honors in studio art and political science from Swarthmore College and she completed her MFA in the Program in Art, School of Art at the California Institute of the Arts. She calls Los Angeles her home, and it's where she works as an artist, writer, and educator. Audrey is known for her research-based projects that communicate political and cultural identities. Her solo and collaborative work has been shown in such venues as the Los Angeles Municipal Art Gallery, the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego, the Ben Maltz Gallery at Otis College of Art and Design, the Chinese American Museum, among others. She is known for working across many art forms, including painting, digital composition, installation, video, public performance, public art, and symposia. One of Audrey's current projects is a public, is as a public artist. She was commissioned to design a large scale multi-part mural that will be installed in a new Metro station in downtown Los Angeles. The station is located in the culturally significant neighborhood known as Little Tokyo. Employing her research driven approach, Audrey's artwork centers community stories and pays tribute to the multiple cultures that have inhabited this area. This new subway route is scheduled to open in 2022. Audrey's other remarkable engagement is as the first artist in residence in the Southern California chapter of the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. Since her residency began in October 2019, she and the ACLU SoCal team have been, quote, working together to find ways for art to amplify the organization's ongoing fight for structural change. I am so proud to welcome Audrey today. She will share with us how artists can and should play critical roles in advocating for social justice causes. Thank you audience for tuning in. And Audrey, I invite you 
to turn on your camera and your microphone and join me at the virtual podium. Welcome, Audrey. Thank you for being here. Hello. Thank you so much, Karen, for that intro. Um, it's really an honor to be here. The Kaleido LA series is so fantastic. There are so many artists that I admire so much. So um, I'm happy to um, be here. And thank you to everyone from the LMU community and beyond for sharing your time today. It's um, incredibly challenging and stressful time. So I really appreciate that you're um, taking the time to, to listen in. So. Um, it's been a huge honor to be the first artist in residence uh, with any ACLU affiliate chapter. I've been um, working with the ACLU of Southern California um, since last October. And I'm just going to uh, jump right in and we can get started. OK, let's see. So um, in their own words, the American Civil Liberties Union or the ACLU defends the fundamental rights outlined in the Constitution and Bill of Rights. Um, practically speaking, um, some of the fights that define their work um, in our lifetimes is a woman's right to choose, uh, the right to protest, our right to free speech and the right to assemble, the right not to be surveilled by the government, the right not to have your rights restricted or denied on the basis of your race, gender, religion, ability, level of income, immigration status, and your status as a housed or unhoused person. Their fight takes place um, most visibly in front of the Supreme Court, but I think what I've learned, especially in the last year, is that their fight also takes place at the state, county, and local levels, um, in the courts, in the legislatures, at school board meetings, in jails, uh, shelters, detention centers, public restrooms and locker rooms, on the street where lack of housing is treated as criminal in the workplace, and on and on and on. Um, as you can imagine, the workload of the ACLU and other advocacy organizations that defend communities impacted by systemic injustices um, has been extremely overwhelming during the last four years. and. Um, we're just a few days away from the election, as we all know. And regardless of the outcome, the fight continues. Um, there's no time to be complacent. I think, um, as we all know, COVID-19 has exacerbated so many of the uh, inequities in our society. And I think we're all learning that we each have our own role to play in making social justice a reality. And I wanted to share some of the images that came out of my time learning about the ACLU SoCal affiliate. Um, the organization, the national organization celebrated its 100th anniversary this year. And um, the SoCal affiliate was the very first affiliate um, founded in 1923. If you look at the top left, um, Upton Sinclair, the incredible uh, writer uh, and activist was arrested for reading the Bill of Rights at um, a demonstration by a San Pedro uh, longshoreman. And so his free speech rights uh, were uh, restricted while he was advocating for others' right to assemble. And um, so, and then over the years, uh, the SoCal affiliate has been at the forefront of so many important issues, like um, during World War II, they were, um, while the national organization didn't make as strong um, a stand against the incarceration of Japanese Americans. The California affiliates of the ACLU filed numerous cases in defense of Japanese American rights um, while they were interned in um, detention centers across the United States. So this is um, an image from the Janum archives of Tule Lake. Um, and uh, on the top right, you'll see Sir Lady Java, who's a pioneering trans activist who had an amazing like review show at uh, Red Foxes Club. And at the time there was um, a rule called rule number nine um, in the city that outlawed so-called female impersonation. And the police, um, the LAPD would enforce this rule and basically making it illegal to be trans or to 
uh, be in drag. And so Sir Lady Java reached out to the ACLU to fight um, the LAPD's enforcement of rule number nine. And um, her case is extremely intersectional in that it's about LGBTQ rights, it's about labor rights, and um, also about police practices in the city. Um, on the bottom left, you'll see that, um, I think we might take it for granted now that um, Metro has kneeling buses that allow access for um, disabled people to ride the public transportation system. But um, actually they weren't in compliance with the ADA until the SoCal affiliate worked um, to defend a group of um, disabled um, residents to sue for um, compliance. And so the affiliate was um, helped to bring about the kneeling buses in um, the metro system. Um, the middle image is really impactful because um, especially for those of you in the artist community, this is Marjan uh, Began, whose uncle was the subject of the, was traveling to the, um, to LAX when Trump signed the Muslim ban into law. And he was not allowed entry into the US and was actually like forcibly uh, removed and um, flown back um, to Iran and uh, her family reached out to the ACLU to work urgently um, to, along with um, so many other advocacy groups to over, to block the Muslim ban. Um, and so that's, I think a time in recent memory that um, the ACLU's role in fighting, uh, I mean, that was right at the beginning of the Trump administration. It's like, it, it re really revealed that their organization was going to play a major role um, in fighting um, so many of the um, terrible injustices of the Trump administration. And um, bottom right is Jose Bayo, who's a student in, um, in Kern County who uh, read a poem called Dear America that was critical of ICE and uh, government immigration policy at a city um, hearing and was then um, arrested and placed in um, ICE detention. And so the ACLU worked um, to release him and to argue for his First Amendment rights. So that's just a, it's sometimes really helpful just to see like how the ACLU's work plays out um, in people's lives and the impact that they have. Um, I'm now jumping around. Um, since before I talk about the residency itself, I just want to talk about what I was working on leading up to it. Um, so in 2015, um, I was selected as a finalist for um, creating artwork for the Little Tokyo Arts District station. Um, this is a rendering of it. This is Central Avenue. This is First Street. It's right across from the Japanese American National Museum and Mocha Geffen, right in the heart of Little Tokyo. Um, I had applied to be on a, um, I replied to an open call to be on a short list. And um, I received a call that I was going to be one of the finalists. And so um, I found out that um, this would be for a commission that would involve 14 porcelain enamel steel panels that would be on the subway platform level of the, tra of the train station. Um, and I think the minute I found out about it, I just knew how charged a site it was and how, what a huge responsibility that was to make a permanent monumental scale sized artwork um, to live in the heart of that community and just like a few blocks away from city hall and like the heart of Los Angeles. And I think this image really brings it home. Um, so this is historic First Street. This is when um, Executive Order 9066 was passed by FDR and the West Coast um, Japanese Americans were forced to um, evacuate their homes and were um, taken to forcibly removed to detention centers um, across the US, including um, nearby in Manzanar. Um, and so this location is directly across the street 
from where the station is going to be now. And so I kind of went into the project knowing how important it would be to connect with um, community organizers and historians and community culture bearers to find out like how to represent those narratives that haven't always been properly written into the history books. Um, and this is from, uh, I think when the artwork was complete, we got a chance to tour the future tunnels. And so these are some of the amazing Metro art staff. There's Pearl Xiong, who's doing an amazing mosaic piece near the Broad. Um, so it was, it was really moving to think about making a piece that responds to history, but also to almost like time travel through this artwork. Um, thinking about what's the future, what will, how will this artwork read um, to future generations? Um, and this was the, these are two of the 14 panels. I just wanted to show them to talk about the process that came out of the work. Um, I knew that I wanted the piece to reflect like different moments in history, having conversation with each other but also bring the different communities that um, intersect at that part of LA in conversation. So we have the little Tokyo community represented. Um, there was, during World War II, um, it was a black neighborhood named Bronzeville. Um, many um, people came to the US to work in like wartime factories and it became uh, like a hub of like the jazz scene. And if you've ever heard of Central Avenue Jazz, it um, went all the way to Little Tokyo. Um, the Tongva tribe is represented. Um, also the Skid Row community and arts district. Um, and I wanted this piece to be, to feel like you were experiencing it in the round. So along the bottom perimeter, um, there's a procession that at times feels like a parade, at times feels like a protest, at times it feels like the Bon Odori honoring of ancestors. That's the traditional um, Japanese dance. And um, also just like a space to connect and feel charged by the power of those who came before. And um, uh, especially with the Skid Row um, panel, I, the person I think most influential and in how this um, panel came about is General Jeff, who's standing here in the white um, Skid Row City Limit shirt. Because um, when I reached out to him, the first thing he said was, you know, I'm only going to talk to you if um, you know that the unhoused community of LA doesn't need more images of encampments. It doesn't need to just be seen as a community that's downtrodden. Um, that doesn't, those images don't help us. And so with that agreement, um, we started talking about like, how do people who are experiencing homelessness, um, what kind of images do they need to see? And so um, this grouping is actually based on a photo mural by Danny Park, whose mother and father owned a bodega in the Skid Row community. Um, and also, and so these are Skid Row residents and advocates. And um, these two pieces are adapted from um, street art that they developed in community um, that in the context of the Metro site uh, makes it permanent and visible to whoever comes through the station, almost like as a welcoming into the neighborhood. Um, and there's also the Los Angeles Poverty Department represented. And so it, these images all came out of a lot of um, conversation that took place over the course of several years. Uh, the process I use is very like accumulative and nonlinear. So I, um, I work a lot on the iPad uh, drawing in this app called Procreate. And I translate those images into um, Adobe Illustrator where I can like make vector images that can be scaled up infinitely. Um, and so I, although I work digitally, I like aim for my work to like feel analog. <laughs> and, um, and this uh, image 
includes Fandango Obon, which is a, um, a cross-cultural interpretation of the Bonodori um, dance and includes um, Mexican, West African um, traditions. And um, this image is really important. Um, it's from the Women's March and an artist friend of mine, Devin Suno, his um, grandmother was a survivor of the internment um, camps and they, and I wanted the energy of the protest and the intergenerational fight for justice to be represented in this piece and to reflect, you know, the time in which it's made. Uh, it's tempting when making like a permanent artwork to aim for some kind of like universal or some kind of middle ground. But for me, truth is found in specificity. And so it's really important for me to include details like um, his grandmother, um, mother and aunt. Um, and so that's to give you a little preview of the Metro artwork um, that's gonna open in 2022. And I want to show this like 30 second clip because I don't actually have that much documentation of like the way I work, um, but this is like a promo that Metro produced that just um, shows my actual working process. So pardon me if the sound is a bit loud. My name is Audrey Chan and I'm creating artwork for the Metro Regional Connector Little Tokyo Arts District Station. My process involves a lot of like moving things around, changing the scale, seeing different relationships that can happen between different images. This is the first time I've worked on a piece that could be considered permanent. And so it made me think what is worth committing to history. really appreciate this video. Um, it was shot by a uh, cinematographer, Paris McCoy, um, who's a third, I believe a third generation Angelina. And um, uh, it, it's kind of like a time capsule of my pregnancy also. <laughs> and so you kind of see me at different stages of pregnancy and postpartum in that video, which I really appreciate. And oops, sorry about that. Um, so jumping ahead, so putting two and two together, I was in the final stages of the Metro project when a friend um, DM'd me on Instagram and said, hey, the ACLU SoCal has an artist in residency program, I think you should apply. And uh, uh, so much of my, um, the opportunities that um, I've been lucky enough to pursue and a lot of my career, including exhibitions has been in response to these kinds of like open calls and requests for qualifications. Um, and this just uh, is kind of like how it started. I read through this um, call that I later learned was um, organized between the Communications and Media Advocacy Department of um, ACLU SoCal and Ana Iwataki, who's um, incredible curator, scholar, and um, civic art um, project manager um, to conceive of like a year long opportunity for an artist to be embedded um, in the organization and to co-create um, all kinds of visual materials um, that could be um, like posters, um, uh, campaign artwork, mural, uh, different kinds of projects. Um, to amplify their work. And, um, and they listed some of the um, campaigns that they had going on, including um, about uh, uh, police practices, district attorney and sheriff accountability, um, LGBTQ rights, immigrants rights, um, voting rights. And I really saw this as a chance to kind of like take the work that I started on, um, with Metro in terms of like connecting like uh, visual storytelling and a kind of like intersectional way of representing LA and um, issues of like disenfranchisement um, in a way that 
was part of the work of an organization I admired so long and was really about right now. Um, and I also thought about this incredible legacy of artists who have, artists have always been a part of social movements and artists have always been present in social justice work. It's like culture is like one arm of a political process. And um, two people who I really, who've really been touchstones for me have been um, Barbara Carrasco and Emery Douglas. So Barbara Carrasco worked with the United Farm Workers Movement. This is her iconic um, portrait of Dolores Huerta. Um, and um, Emery Douglas, who was the Minister of Culture for the Black Panther Party. And this image in particular incorporates like a 17 year old who had been killed by Oakland uh, police after he had been uh, mentored by um, Black Panther leaders. And in his hands, he's holding a document that, that says community control of police. And so there's like a direct through line from that work from 1971 to calls today to defund the police and invest in communities. And so it's like, whenever I'm kind of stuck in a rut, I look back to who um, the work of artists and they're still working and thriving today. And um, just thinking about uh, what it means to like be part of like a lineage of artists and today who are working in community, who are working in different capacities um, is movement building and, and trying to contribute some small part to it. Um, and so when I started at the ACLU, I was learning about their specific affiliate and their inner workings. And so this is their theory of change where they're articulating who they're fighting for. Um, the ACLU has affiliate offices in all 50 states. California being um, so massive has three affiliates and um, the SoCal affiliate um, serves people in LA, in Los Angeles County, Kern, Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino, San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties. Um, so it's not just LA by any means. And um, depending on the issue, and their issue areas um, include immigrant rights, um, police practices, um, LGBTQ rights, um, I could go on. Um, they, uh, the staff work together to identify a strategy of like how to develop a campaign together. Um, they are, sometimes these campaigns are organized around impact litigation where um, people's testimonies and firsthand experiences like mobilized into a case and a legal argument that will hopefully um, set a legal precedent that can help people in a similar situation. So that's just like impact litigation in a nutshell. Um, and the ACLU SoCal also does um, community organizing, activist engagement. They do a lot of know your rights work in educating the public, um, media advocacy, uh, policy research and advocacy. So like drafting legislation, working for years to get bills passed. Um, and I think a really important, I don't have a slide of it up, but it's like they acknowledge that the people who are most impacted by systemic injustice are um, black and brown communities, people from minority religions, people who are, who are disabled, who can't exercise their rights fully. Um, and so that is um, just a core understanding to who and what, um, why they do the work and who it's for. Um, the, I was embedded with the communications and media advocacy um, department and they produce, um, they help uh, create the, they translate the organization's work to the public. Um, so they have um, like digital strategy. Uh, they work, they even work with influencers as being like LA and the heart of the entertainment industry. They um, design um, the reports. These ACLU's reports have like such a huge impact on like um, legislation. And um, they produce like graphics and videos to get the public engaged um, in what they're doing. And their website is aclusocal.org if 
you want to find out more. Um, and so for months, I was learning about the SoCal affiliate and its history. And um, we we're trying to figure out like what my role would be as part of the team, since they've, they've worked with artists in the past. Like I'm not the first artist they've ever worked with. It's I was given the opportunity to work with them closely for a year. Um, but I think in order to not replicate what they already do so well, um, we realized that one of the things that I brought to the team was that I could draw <laughs> and that I could draw portraits. Um, and so we really leaned into that as um, my role on the team. And so the first campaign that I was brought onto was the Ice is Not Welcome Here campaign. and um, it was a uh, Know Your Rights campaign to um, educate people about their rights um, of what to do when ICE is at their door. Um, and at this time, um, ICE was impersonating police. They were impersonating um, probation officers, um, lying to people at their doors to get them to open um, the door and let them in. Um, They're even lying. I mean, this is still going on. Uh, lying to people telling them, oh, there's a problem with your car, you need to come outside. Um, and so it was really important to get the word out about what to do um, when ICE is knocking. And so this, it was a bilingual campaign and I wanted the poster also to reflect the um, diverse community of immigrants that are impacted by um, immigration detention and enforcement. Um, and so it translates to, this is our community. We know our rights. We do not consent. ICE is not welcome here. And um, I was brought on to kind of bring this character of Nina to life. Um, she's, a, what they told me was like, we want a Latinx girl who is standing strong with her family and her community and resisting the deceptive tactics of ICE and strong in their knowledge of their rights. And so this is very much a campaign directed to like community empowerment. Um, just to give you a sense of the department's like narrative change work, um, it's not it's not important. It's not um, enough to just point to a problem, but also to present like an alternate uh, view. And so on the right are just like a few screenshots of like LA Times headlines and photos for when you look up like ice raids. And it gives you the sense of this kind of like faceless, ominous force that's like marauding immigrant communities and snatching people away. And so there's a lot of fear mongering that's done by the government and just like a culture of fear um, that the Trump administration has been um, really exacerbating um, in the immigrant community. And so, um, Nina is this character who's pre pre providing this kind of like counterpoint to these images of people being rounded up and dehumanized and entered into a um, system that thrives on misery. And um, uh, uh, Marcus, who's the head of the department, he's, he wanted verified document and report to be like the stop, drop and roll of um, this campaign. And so, you're literally just kind of like using pictures and words to explain to people like, how do you verify if the person at the door is actually a probation officer or police officer? What can neighbors do to document illegal ICE raids? Um, and there's this mobile justice app that they developed where any video that you take will be um, sent directly to the ACLU SoCal and has a, a potential to be like evidence in a future litigation um, and so these graphics were designed to circulate on social media. Actually, the um, California stay at home order started right when I joined this campaign. So like everything on this campaign and forward, I've been doing remotely, like I'm in my bedroom right now, like this is basically my studio and all our communication has been like um, uh, remote. So my residency has been like half in person, half online. Um, and this is a community handbook. It's actually meant to be printed on one sheet of paper and folded and cut into a miniature zine. And um, it provides some more information and hotlines um, of what to do. And um, thinking also about the COVID context, um, 
the immigration rights and also the economic, economic justice team really wanted to foreground the voices of people who were the most vulnerable um, during the COVID um, pandemic. And that includes people in immigration detention and the jail system and also shelters. So this is um, Sofia Bahena Ortuño, who is um, a farm worker, mother, grandmother, who is who had diabetes and hyperthyroidism. Um, she was detained by ICE at Mesa Verde Detention Center in Bakersfield. She was part of a Mother's Day um, campaign. And if you go, and this is still in, um, an active link. So if you go to bit.ly stop ICE transfers, you'll go to this page um, where you'll see George Lopez's story. So I provided, I worked from like family photos and different kinds of images. Um, to show people's vibrancy before they were detained. Um, so that uh, even though they were being, victim being victimized by this system, that they could be represented in their full dignity. And so George was directed his message directly to Governor Gavin Newsom, the one person who has the most authority over um, immigration detention and its regulation in California. Um, so his message was directly to the governor. Um, Oscar Holguin was released from Riverside County only after contracting um, COVID-19. So these were all part of a video series that I worked on um, with the creative director, um, Jenna at the ACLU. And I have two examples that I'm just gonna play for you. A lot of our fear was dying and not seeing our families because this is a fatal virus, you know, and at the time they didn't have any knowledge of the virus. So it was very scary for us to think this could be the last place. This could be the last human contact that you have with people. You might not be able to get home to your kids. I really think that this experience has not only affected me, but my one-year-old who is very small and, you know, he was, uh, um, Coming out, it was very different. It was my son. He didn't necessarily recognize me at first. And, um, you know, it's little things that like now I see him and he's grown up so much in, in such short period of time. And I feel very, very overwhelmed that I have that I've missed some of his milestones and some of the uh, things that, you know, he's learned on my time away. Like he's not used to calling me mom anymore. He's he calls me Bree, so it's a little different and it's a little hard to hear him call me by my name, but I'm very thankful that my son was able to go to my mom instead of the system. We're not just a number, you know, we're, we're human beings. We deserve to be treated as human beings. They can't just come in and break us apart from our families and make us go through all this pain, especially at this time right now when not only is San Diego in crisis, but the whole world. So um, Briseida Salazar was um, detained at Ote Mesa Detention Center in San Diego. And um, she helped to organize a hunger strike when um, ICE, uh, when they were demanding that ICE provide PPE, they, the company CoreCivic, the for-profit prison company that owns, that operates the detention center said that they'd only give PPE if um, they signed a document that released the company of any liability. And so she helped to organize a hunger strike um, protesting that. And I wanna show another example of, oops, sorry about that. Of um, Joyce Van Nortrick, who, oops, sorry about this, um, who, uh, is in the OC emergency shelter system and um, had, sorry, I'm just trying to figure out how to get the slides going again. Um, let's see. I need to do it like so. Who um, was, you know, I think it's at great risk that they're 
taking the time to speak out and shed light on what's going on in systems that can be extremely opaque and which people um, are really at the mercy of um, the people running on the shelters and like the economic justice team has been really dedicated to shifting the narrative from like a shelters first um, argument to housing first as a way to support unhoused residents residents of our counties. So I'm just going to play Joyce's testimony. Hi, Joyce. Hi. So I just wanted to check in with you. I mean, while the rest of us are self-isolating in our own homes, you're in an emergency shelter self-isolating with about 200 other people. Can you tell me what your biggest concern is? I'm gonna die here. Oh, Joyce. I honestly feel that I'll take my last breath here. I told my manager, he says, Joyce, if you get this, your chance of surviving is very, very low. I have to be where my oxygen machine is. I, it's not a case that I could go somewhere in the building and keep myself away. It's not an option for me to feel comfortable and safe here. Are you able to sort of describe for me what it's like in this shelter? It's awful. I'm in the women's dorm and there's 68 other women in here. If we're supposed to be spaced six feet apart, no, we're not. Our beds are three feet apart. There's absolutely no way possible for me to do like the CDC says and be six feet away from somebody else. Um, I wanted to ask you, Joyce, what are your hopes and dreams for the future? Being able to be in my own place. And if I want to grow flowers, grow flowers. If I want to grow my own vegetables, grow my own vegetables. I want to be able to feel like I can live my life in safety. Being safe. Yeah, so um, these videos were part of um, like digital advocacy to um, encourage people to sign petitions to the governor to um, support people in jails, uh, shelters and detention centers. And, you know, these, these issues um, are, are still ongoing. And so there's so many ways to plug into that work. So um, let me just move along more quickly as we close to the finish line. Um, I was also invited to create a portrait series for um, to celebrate Asian American Pacific Islander month. Um, this is, I think the backdrop of this year's um, uh, commemoration was um, like increasing racism against uh, Asian American people. Uh, and it was important for us to show how Asian Americans have like always been involved in social justice work and civil rights work, even if they haven't been like the marquee faces <laughs> of, of that movement building. Um, I mean, you have people like Wong Kim Ark, um, who was born in San Francisco during the time of the Chinese Exclusion Act and his landmark Supreme Court case established um, birthright citizenship in the US. Um, Nai Norn is a what came to the US as a Cambodian refugee. And um, due to her own experiences, she in being incarcerated um, as a domestic abuse survivor, she is an advocate for the Survived and Punished um, Coalition. Um, and a huge percentage of the women in um, the prison system are survivors of abuse. Um, and um, Fal Silk is also came to the US as a Cambodian refugee and was incarcerated and tried as an adult when he was a youth and was immediately processed into ICE detention 
um, when his time was up. And today, and he was granted a pardon from Governor Newsom, and today is an organizer with the Youth Justice Coalition, and they do incredible work at the intersection of um, the prison and um, immigration detention system. Mia Yamamoto is a, a criminal justice um, attorney and trans activist um, who is a survivor of the um, Poston internment camp. In fact, she was born there um, and uh, does incredible organizing. Um, Yuri Kochiyama and Grace Lee Boggs, I mean, like, could speak for hours about their influence and legacy. Um, but I wanted to, and so we worked across with the comms teams from across the state to identify like who to feature and foreground. Um, and the South Bay High Chief Loa Pele Falitogo has been um, a really important advocate for the American Samoan community. Um, and um, Larry Itliong, connecting back to even Barbara Carrasco's work, um, the organizing Filipino farm workers was crucial to the United Farm Workers Movement. Um, and so I think a lot about like who gets to be seen in history and any chance I can get to make an intervention into that process, it's really important to me. Um, this is uh, just a little time lapse to show like the process of digital painting that I'm doing. So I feel like I'm, I'm very like uh, not skilled analog watercolor painting, but um, digitally it, I appreciate the amount of control I have and the ability that you can like work in layers and step backwards. So this is just a little look into that process. Um, and yeah, I've been working primarily digitally for the past several years It like with Metro, it allowed me to work in a kind of nonlinear way, swapping images in and out, making adjustments. And um, like for um, the ACLU, so much of the work is destined for like print or um, social media. And so it's kind of like a natural fit. Um, but it was really great to just like spend time with um, Grace Lee Boggs's representation. And then um, um, I was also invited to create portraits for um, the ACLU's commemoration of um, Pride Month. And this year, as you all know, the celebration of the Black, queer, and trans community, um, LGBTQ community was extremely important. It's like there is so much um, mourning and loss uh, that was um, circulating in social media. And it's like um, so important also to celebrate, uplift the people who are still with us, who um, are doing the work and advocating. So Juice and Navi Husky reached out to the ACL SoCal when they were um, faced gender discrimination at the public restrooms at Coachella. Um, AEG, the company that owns Coachella, is a major Republican uh, donor. Um, I think they've donated like millions of dollars to Republican Party and anti-LGBT causes. And so um, they're incredible like trans siblings who use like their personal experience to, to demand that Coachella be a trans inclusive space. Um, Christine Lily Renee Wood, um, was being barred by her gym, Crunch Fitness, in San Diego when she was trying to use the locker rooms. Um, and she talks about how, you know, uh, like exercise was such an important part of her transition and um, coming into her um, true self. And so the fact of being like humiliated in that context, um, and it's also a violation of criminal, of California civil rights law. Um, and so she worked with the ACLU to sue um, Crunch Fitness. So that's why I was saying like, even gyms, restrooms, you know, where are people's rights being violated? Um, this is the amazing trio behind the transgender district in San Francisco. Um, so the Compton's cafeteria riot actually predated um, Stonewall and was the first like trans riot um, when, um, I think a trans woman was resisting arrest by police who had been harassing the trans community for like decades at that point. Um, and today they've organized the transgender district into like six blocks in the Tenderloin district that's dedicated 
to um, supporting the trans community through um, like healing, um, like job opportunities, and also like a place where people could genuinely go to feel supported. Um, and so um, it was really amazing to like draw this kind of like triple portrait of them. And here's just a kind of look at like what it's like to like work from photo references. Um, and the it's kind of like a composite sketch from different sources of Miss Janetta. And gotta um, really give big props to Patrice Cullors, co-founder of Black Lives Matter. And I love this quote from her because um, it's about the importance of um, acknowledging that we all need to show up to be activists in our own way um, from our own spheres of influence and also to bring our full selves into the work. Um, and I think it's uh, so important to have the leadership of queer black women at the foreground right now. And um, also the fact that she's an artist and like founder of the Crenshaw Dairy Mart space. And so it was really an honor to do this portrait. And so I'm gonna end with um, Patrice's portrait and we can um, start the Q&A if anyone has questions. And thank you so much everyone for your time. Sorry, I went kind of fast <laughs> through that material. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a few questions. Uh, the first is actually going back to the Metro project. Mm -hmm. um, did you meet with people who live in the neighborhood and how long did you spend making the work? Yeah, so I had a lot of um, in person meetings, it was a combination of like meeting in person, um, looking through archival materials that people would point me to um, lots of emails, uh, going to community events. Um, and so I proposed the artwork in 2015, I got the commission in 2016, and then worked pretty much for three years um, until 2019. And it was really hard to stop working on it. <laughs> Actually, I felt like I was, I learned through so much through the process, like the difference between the final artwork and what I proposed, um, just like reflected those years of um, like outreach and conversation and, and also those communities, um, generosity and openness towards me and my process. Wonderful. The next question is, um, it seems clear to me how much the ACLU got out of their collaboration with you. What do you feel like you got out of the artist in residence experience? Oh, I mean, I actually feel the opposite. <laughs> I, I'm just like, I just did some drawings. I learned a ton from just like being in meetings, getting to see behind the scenes, um, like the nuts and bolts of their work. Sometimes cases would take years um, to work on. And of course, on the public end, we just see the outcomes, we see the victories, we see the losses, um, we see, you know, whatever makes the headlines, but there's so much like nights and weekends kind of work that goes on. And I just got to see, especially during COVID um, and during the Trump administration in general, just like how they rush in to problem solve and um, and I, when I was an undergrad, I was trying to figure out if I should, um, like pursue being an artist, um, which path I wasn't, I wasn't sure, like, it wasn't clear to me at the time how to make that work, um, besides just like blind faith and applying for an MFA program, um, versus doing like a public policy career. And I think I had an art teacher at the time who said, you know, like, art is going to be the way that you contribute. And I think over the subsequent many years, I've been trying to like live up to that. But also I had this, I'm, I'm really into like policy and um, like organizing and how people like build power and how like artwork and images can um, like feed political life and like shape our identities and the way we see history and frame issues that like this residency was it kind of like put everything together um to feel like i don't need to 
uh, like they carved out a space for an artist to work alongside them. And um, I'm kind of like an ACLU withdrawal right now because um, I'm, I'm, what I'm not able to show today is the culminating project. We're actually doing a large scale mural together on the facade of the building, but it, the timeline's um, not quite ready for me to share that image yet. So a lot of the work I've been doing is kind of like leading up to that. And I've been able to work with them to like build capacity for them to commission public art. Um, so anyway, I, I feel like I, I gained so much more <laughs> than they did for me. Um, and hopefully the work can continue in some capacity. So furthering the question uh, with your relationship with the ACLU, um, do you have any idea how, uh, who will be the next artist in residence? And are you helping choose that next artist? And the um, final question of that is um, uh, sort of logistics. How did the ACLU compensate you? Oh, um, there was a stipend attached to the residency. Um, the information's online, I'm not gonna say here, but um, I think it was uh, acknowledged that, you know, art is labor. <laughs> and I take that seriously. I'm working as an artist full time right now. So it's, I appreciate when people like recognize the labor of, of artists. Um, and I, um, I hope they can continue the program. Um, hopefully they have funding for it. You know, it's like, as we all know, arts are always like the first things um, to be cut. And so I hope that the work that we did together shows like the value of um, having an artist work alongside them in this kind of sustained way and how our processes could like influence each other. But um, I'm not entirely certain um, how or in what capacity the programs um, can continue. I, let's hope that it can. Okay, we have one last question. Um, I love how you use your artistic talents to talk about and support social injustices in the world. What are some of the most memorable experiences throughout your career so far that have truly impacted you or your point of view about something? Wow. Um, I mean, these doing the Metro project and doing the residency with ACLU have been definite like high points um, for me. But um, I mean, I'm even thinking about going back and just before I even like could really understand that I would be an artist when I was younger, like my dad would um, tell me stories about my family's experience. Um, at the dawn of like the communist revolution. And I'm actually gonna tab forward cause I have, this is a piece that's up in the self-help graphics um, Dia de los Muertos show that's online right now. I recommend everyone check that out. Um, it's, you can experience it digitally. And so I think, although I would learn this phrase later the idea of like the personal is political really got its start <laughs> through um, cause I grew up, my grandma moved to Chicago when I was born. And so we grew up, um, I grew up with her and just trying to like reconcile, like the experiences that she had in her life. And the fact that you don't get to choose if you're political, everyone's born into political circumstances. And it's about like how you navigate and how you, um, move through your own time in history. Um, I think she like I included these because I just wanted to show like that the public work that I've been doing is like very informed by the kind of like personal narrative work that like weaves in and out of my projects over the years and she's like a constant muse and so I think I've just been getting closer and closer to like finding out how that manifests in like living a full-time life as an artist and like aligning with projects and um, ways of working that stay true to that to that kind of um, ideal of making visible um, how personal experience uh, speaks multitudes about um, um, history and power and identity. 
Thank you so much. I'm gonna ha have Karen pop back in. Hi, Audrey. Hello. Thank you so much for sharing the, the background for the work that you've done for the ACLU and for Metro in addition to your work. I think that it's so clear what commitment you have to the work um, that the ACLU is doing and, and that Metro is doing by representing the neighborhood. Um, I read a quote about something that the uh, ACLU SoCal Executive Director Hector Viagra mm -hmm. said about you, which I really um, agree with. He talks about how excited he was for you to join as the um, artist in residence um, because of your research-based projects, but also your deep sense of empathy. And that is a, a, um, a, a term that gets used a lot at LMU. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think for our students um, who are artists who are listening today, can you talk a little bit about building empathy as an artist and how that worked out like at the ACLU? You know, I have to kind of go way in the way back machine to, <laughs> to answer that. I think it's helpful that you mentioned that I grew up in the Midwest um, and I grew up in a suburb of Chicago. And I think I didn't really have any other choice when I was growing up because sometimes I'd be like the only Asian American person in my whole year. And I just had to like figure out how other people felt and thought because I didn't, I, I was kind of like this outsider in a way, or there were times when kids would say something racist to me. And I was just kind of like, I didn't have a, like that kind of solidarity community, <laughs> you know, that's only in, in terms of like outside my family, I feel like that's something very specific to like why I was drawn to the West coast and why I was drawn to LA and like the work that I'm doing now. Um, because I didn't really have um, a chance to understand anything other than trying to understand why someone would have these like negative opinions of someone based on race or um, or or whatnot. And so I'm really interested in kind of doing work that acknowledges difference um, because it's just like a part of especially a part of like American life um, and for better and for worse, you know, it's like, it's reality. So I think that was just kind of baked in to me from a young age and like how to not just stand up for yourself, but for other people. I think that's just like a core value. That's obviously as important now <laughs> mm -hmm. as ever before. And I think what's, what's been really exciting is like finding ways to do that as an artist. Um, it's been like a huge learning experience and I'm not like done learning about it. Um, but also I think the opportunity to work in like civic um, spaces and like thinking about public art as like a site of activism, you know, has been just really eye opening for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, think I also went to a Jesuit high school oh, you did. and a Quaker college. So I'm, I'm also like a product of these kind of like social justice um, education models too. I did not know that. I love hearing that because it kind of creates then a through line. Um, uh, how did the pandemic specifically then change any kind of relationship that you had with the ACLU team? Because I was reading that, you know, things would in uh, a non-pandemic environment have much more, um, you know, uh, in-person contact. Did that change how you had to think about your projects with them? Well, I'm glad I had those few months of like meeting with people in person. So I was going into their headquarters on 8th Street, like, two or three times a week for meetings. So like there would be a project directors meeting where um, the heads of those different issue areas would present like briefings on like the developments 
um, on the work that they're doing. And also I'd be in like strategy sessions with the communications department. And really um, it was, it was um, fairly seamless. Like they had a lot of methods of like teleconferencing <laughs> and we just use Slack a lot more. And I mean, I've been kind of working from home. I'm literally like in my bedroom where I have like a desk <laughs> where my computer lives. Um, and so that aspect of working was um, kind of like I already was working from home. Um, I think the difference is that um, like my son um, was home with us. And so I was much more a like um, mother artist residence. <laughs> kind of, it was uh, the, each day felt very short. Um, mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. But I, I mean, work keeps me grounded. Um, so I've been really thankful to have that work to like direct my energy and also like anxieties too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so um, yeah, it's kind of bittersweet. I, I'm, I'm really, I think we met up in a social distance way, like at the headquarters a month or two ago just to like start planning out the mural um so yeah but we've had a lot of contact just not in person well i will be letting everybody know here in kaleido when the mural um mm -hmm. can be shared and then i'm looking forward to being able to show that at some point um in the future um i am delighted that we were able to have you speaking this fall um, your work first and foremost caught my eye um, when I would see it uh, on Instagram. And so that's kudos to you because first and foremost, the work that you've done is just beautiful and brings so much dignity to the people who are being um, represented. So Audrey, you are a rock star and I thank you. I thank the ACLU for including an artist in their work. Um, and it's a privilege to be able to hear from you today. Next week, next Friday, Dr. Tiffany Barber will be joining us. She is a professor in art history and in African studies at the University of Delaware. So I hope if you have time on Friday, you can join us again for Kaleido. Thank you so much, Audrey. It was Thank a pleasure. Thank you so much, Karen. This was a Thank huge you. honor. Thank you so much.